coming to you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urie, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome again to Bread of His Presence. You know, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Mark chapter 5. That's Mark chapter 5. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at two of the most powerful, most touching miracles of Jesus recorded for us in Scripture. And miracles, whenever we see them in the Bible, they are usually separate, more isolated events. But the two miracles that we're going to be studying today and in the coming weeks are really unique in that both of them really sort of collide with one another. And not only that, but they provide for us through sort of a comparison and contrast, a more full-orbed picture of who Jesus is and what he came to do for us. Now, the first of these miracles involves a woman with an issue of blood and takes place in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 34. And so we're going to start with that miracle before then moving on to a miracle performed for a ruler of a synagogue by the name of Jairus. And what's so interesting about the arrangements of these miracles is that they overlap with each other to the point where what we really see is an example of a miracle within a miracle, a story within a story. And the miracles are so notable that they're recorded in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going to focus on Mark's account, but we're also going to pull in details from Matthew's account in the ninth chapter of his gospel and Luke's account in the eighth chapter of his. And we'll focus on the first miracle this week and next week and then move on to the second miracle in the weeks that follow. But I'd like to open kind of just with a little bit of an intro, a little bit of background into what is going on in the ministry of Jesus at this time, because one of the main things we're going to see is how both of these miracles really demonstrate the absolute authority of Jesus over all of creation. No matter who you are, what you're going through, Jesus is powerful enough to meet your needs. And some of those needs are very, very great. Because ever since mankind fell into sin back in the Garden of Eden, all of creation has been subjected to death and decay and all sorts of various diseases and torment. I mean, there's pain, grief, brokenness and all manner of suffering. So much so that Paul writes in Romans 8.22, saying, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And when we're going through that groaning, oftentimes we cry out in our hearts, Is there any hope of escape? Are we ever going to be free of this? And the good news is that, yes, God does have an escape plan. And that escape plan comes to us in and through his son, Jesus Christ, our deliverer, our rescuer, and our savior. Mark opens his gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, by telling us that this is the beginning of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ the Son of God. You see, the good news is that Jesus has come to, in himself, bring us deliverance from sin, and ultimately, disease and death, and every other symptom that sin has brought into our world. And Mark's purpose, Matthew's purpose, Luke's purpose, even John's purpose, is to declare to us the good news that Jesus has come to crush the power of Satan in our lives, 
to reverse the curse inflicted upon mankind back in the Garden of Eden. He, as the agent of life, came to destroy death itself and cause all those who abide in him to share in his eternal, everlasting life. First in a new heaven and eventually in a new earth that he himself will create. Because as Colossians 1.16 reveals, Jesus is the creator of all things. And because he is the creator, he has absolute authority over his creation. Absolute power over everything that you and I face. Whether that be demons, disease, death, whatever else. And this is precisely the authority that Jesus demonstrated while here on earth. The moment his ministry begins, even before any major teachings or sermons are given, Jesus is driving out demons. He's healing the sick. He's freeing every person who comes to him with various afflictions and diseases that up until that time were seemingly inescapable. And that's where you and I often find ourselves, even today, in situations that seem absolutely inescapable. But what is so remarkable is that when Jesus comes on the scene, every oppressive thing that seemed to hold absolute dominion crumbled and gave way in an instant Every oppressive darkness fell prostrate and was driven out when the light of the world entered in. There was no demon strong enough, no sickness strong enough, no death absolute enough to withstand the power of Jesus. In him, death itself was working backwards. People were being freed from the most unimaginable, unbreakable chains. And suddenly the people who had been sitting in the valley of darkness were seeing this great, tremendous light. As they had in their very midst one who could control the very wind and the waves. Who is touching people and giving them new organs new limbs, even food. In fact, in the previous section, Jesus didn't just drive out a demon, but an entire legion, an army of demons that had come to inhabit a man. They asked his permission to go into a herd of pigs, and at his word, those demons did. And that entire herd went off a cliff into the sea. I mean, What authority, what power, and nobody was turned away. All who came to Jesus were healed. Now, in addition to the authority of Jesus, we also see, coupled with that, another key aspect of Jesus' ministry. And that was the compassion of Jesus. Jesus could have demonstrated his power and his authority in any number of ways. He could have caused the sun to stand still again. (laughs) He could have caused the moon to dance across the sky. Many of you have seen the recent eclipse. He could have caused an eclipse every day. He could have caused mountains to hurl themselves into the sea or any number of things. But instead, the way that Jesus chose to demonstrate his authority and his power was in and through acts of mercy and compassion. He chose to demonstrate his authority through healing. And in that, he demonstrates the awesome mercy of God. That God cares about every trial, every tribulation that we go through. And in and through every healing that Jesus performs, he also demonstrates his ability to perform the even greater healing that each and every one of us needs. Healing from sin. Healing made possible by his very own death and resurrection. 
through which we can receive forgiveness from our sins, but also freedom from its power over our lives. Now, the first miracle in this passage we're going to be looking at is really remarkable because it begins with Jesus about to perform the incredible miracle of raising somebody from the dead. But as Jesus is on his way to perform that miracle, he's interrupted by yet another miracle that really serves to enhance and add momentum to the even greater miracle soon to take place. And this interrupting miracle involves a person that, in many ways, is the opposite kind of person to the one about to receive the greater miracle. Go to Luke with me, starting at verse 21. It says, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. So Jesus had just performed this incredible exorcism on the eastern side of the Lake of Galilee. The people there were frightened. Remember, they tell him to leave. Imagine that. And so he does. He gets into the boat with his disciples and leaves towards the northern tip of the Lake of Galilee and travels about six miles to the western side of Capernaum, where they had begun. And waiting for them, no surprise, is a great crowd. In fact, according to Luke 8.40, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. And they have gathered there because they have either seen or experienced his awesome power and are inescapably drawn to him. They want to be with him all the time. Even the demoniac who had been healed, he wanted to follow Jesus. But instead, Jesus turned him into the first commissioned missionary. He told him, go tell the good news of what Christ has done for you. And so he does. But these people, they have gathered because they too want to experience the awesome power of Jesus, which was unlike anything they had ever seen or heard before. Displayed in Jesus was the very power of God. When he taught, he was speaking the very words of God. And people recognized that awesome authority, which came from the fact that he didn't just speak truth. No, he was. He is truth itself, or I should say himself. You know, one of the truths that I've had to come to terms with in my own ministry is the simple fact that I'm not Jesus. I'll give you a second to absorb that. Okay, that's long enough. But I'm not Jesus. And I'm reminded of that fact Every single time I visit someone in the hospital, every time I perform a funeral, one of the frustrating things to me about being a pastor is that I cannot always take away people's pain. All I can do is intercede for them before the throne of grace and trust in the power of Jesus, which I have done many times in many emergency rooms. Now, emergency rooms are often crowded enough as it is. Oftentimes, you have to wait hours just to be seen. But imagine hearing on the news that visiting the hospital in your town or your city is a physician who immediately heals anyone and everyone who comes to him. That people can come in blind and seconds later leave seeing. That people without legs can come in on a stretcher one minute and be dancing out the front door on new legs the next minute. How crowded do you think that emergency room is going to get? Well, that's what's happening. Everyone is coming to Jesus from every direction. Tens of thousands of people, not only from Capernaum, but from all over the surrounding area. 
and many of them no doubt suffered from horrible diseases, infirmities, sicknesses that they were hoping to be healed from. And don't miss the fact that this crowd was there when Jesus left and was there when he got back. They never left. And note also how in these accounts, there is never any question of whether or not Jesus is able to heal. There's no doubt. Too many miracles have been performed at this point. Nobody wonders if Jesus has the power to heal. They're only concerned with how do we get to him? This is the state of the two people that we're going to encounter in these two narratives. The first being a man of great importance, and the second being a woman of absolutely no importance, at least by any worldly standard. He is rich. She is poor. He is respected. She is rejected. He is honored. She is ashamed. He is a ruler of the synagogue. She is one who has been excommunicated from the synagogue. He has a 12-year-old daughter who is dying. She has a 12-year-old disease that has caused her tremendous suffering. These are people who are on opposite sides of the social spectrum. And yet both have an incredible need for Jesus. You know, in reading this passage, I was just struck by the phrase, fell at his feet. Both of them approach Jesus the exact same way. Both of them are said to fall at the feet of Jesus. And it is at the feet of Jesus that they receive the answer to their need. And nothing has changed, by the way. Forgiveness, healing, deliverance, freedom, victory, all of that begins not in our own strength, but at the feet of Jesus, in submission to his power and his authority. And so today, come to his feet. Come to the feet of Jesus. Whatever you're carrying, sin, sickness, spiritual or emotional bondage, all your anxieties and fears, whatever you are carrying, bring right now and lay them at his feet. And he will meet you in your hour of need. Now, he won't always take your suffering away, but he has promised to be with you in that suffering and to make a way for you to stand in the midst of it, being made more like him as you await the day when all sickness and all disease will fall away as we who have placed our faith in him will enter into his eternal glory. Come to his feet today. Amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.